the announcements, um, I actually want to blend pretty much into the discussions. Um, Attorney General Donovan is here partly because I have I asked him to attend. Um, and this is where it sort of blends into the discussions part of the evening, because many of you were concerned, um, and I got emails from a lot of you about feeling that somehow the work of the panel was really not getting to the places it needed to go, particularly during the last, oh, I should say seven weeks or so, certainly since the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis. I wrote you all an email, um, and it was not all that I should have written. I just unfortunately really didn't have time to write everything that I should have. Um, and I was sort of saying that, you know, please rest assured that it is, the work is getting forth. You'll recall back in, oh, probably February now, um, we talked about the necessity of protecting the work product that we submitted in December, getting it in front of the legislature over and over again. Um, that has happened, but I do have to say um, that has not been easy in many ways. It's been rocky. And I'll go so far as to say there's been part of me that's been a little bit disillusioned, but I've been known for my doe-eyed optimism. So, uh, you know, there it is. Um, I spent an awful lot of time getting lots of invitations to testify to various subsets of the legislature over the last seven weeks and did so trying to put forth ideas that you all have brought up and have written about and indeed were in the report. Um, it was quite interesting. The metaphor that I've used for it is feeling a bit like the ugly kid in high school who never gets invited to the prom and suddenly some kind of magic happens and the kid turns really attractive and suddenly everybody wants to take him to the prom. And he's like juggling suitors and like, oh no, I can't see you then because I don't know, I left the stove on. That was pretty much how it was over the past seven weeks. Um, it was crazy. I mean, I'll never hear from these people again, but it was rather exciting for a while. I actually felt important for a few minutes. And what I kept doing, which was really quite bizarre, was literally on the computer, pulling up the report, which I have an icon for, and reading it verbatim to people. This got a little frustrating. The first couple times I was like, okay, you know, so on. By the fifth time, literally the fifth time, I was getting a little frustrated, kind of like I wanted to get snarky and say, it's big pictures and font. It's really okay. Um, people really hadn't read it. I was really directing people to it and trying to get them to see that we had done an awful lot of work. Um, some of you will recall that after presenting it in December, um, we were asked by um, Senator Sears, actually, to provide some more specificity on certain parts of the report. Um, we didn't get that. That's not entirely anybody's fault other than this damn virus. Um, but I am hoping that that will still happen. Um, and I just want to assure people that the report now is very much out there. It could be out there some more. Um, I think there are a lot of things in it that are actually in front of the legislature right now. I think we probably will be needed to call to specify some things a little bit better. But I that is a long way of saying. That is partly why I asked um, Attorney General Donovan to come, because we certainly we serve at his pleasure. And I'm hoping that he'll be able to sort of well, what would one say, um, help us help us disseminate, help us get the work out there um, in a bit more of an expeditious fashion than has hitherto been the case. Um, so. I'll stop talking. Um, everybody else, feel free to to chime in here. Eitan, I just want to say that 
we've all had that same experience with reports we've submitted to the legislature. <clears throat> Good to know. Thank right. you. Doesn't make you feel any better, but I just want <laughs> I just want you to know that it's not it's not you <laughs> or us or the panel. And so <laughs> we, I've gone and opened it up and read back to them things that we've submitted as well. I can vouch Thank for that, you. Aton. It's Pardon? Uh, I okay. can vouch for that. I mean, that's same experience we've all had. I think I've wanted to sort of speak to a lot of us who aren't don't have the legislative experience. I I did figure, thank you, I did figure that this was probably fairly common. It just felt frustrating in that there were moments of, oh my God, we're reinventing the wheel. Um, <laughs> I'm missing law and order, people. I need, you know, <laughs> um, I, I, I need the TV and you're wasting my time. But in any event, I think it's actually worked. It's. I think I felt more acutely about it because they were asking questions that were already answered and in front of them. And so I was just sort of frustrated. I'll stop. Hey, John, and, what, uh, what, when we spoke about this, first of all, I just want to say I appreciate your humor and your humility. Uh, <laughs> In, in sharing this and in, in, in your remarks. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, I think we've all had the, the, the similar experience of our interactions with the legislature and certainly uh, with reports that we've submitted uh, per legislative mandate. Uh, but given the issues of racial equity um, that are being debated, uh, given the issues of um, police accountability and use of force. What I'd suggested to, to Aton, and certainly would put it out to the group, um, and you know, I appreciate when when Aton you, you you said, well, this panel serves at my pleasure. I've never really viewed it that this way. Uh, that oh. way, I view, it, I view it as that. Um, I think we're supposed to provide administrative support to you guys, uh, uh, okay. uh, which we're happy to do. Um, so this is. Uh, a collaborative effort, uh, but it may make sense to um, hold a press conference and reissue uh, the report and get out in front of the reporters the findings and the specific recommendations uh, as we get ready to go back um, in August, where I can guarantee Aton and others will be asked to testify yet again, probably very similar to their testimony that they provided in the month of June, if not July. And so, you know, there there is this window of opportunity, I think, um, to say, hey, we've been this panel uh, has been working. Uh, there are members of this panel, there are community members that have been working on, on these issues for years, uh, for years. And it's not just this panel, but this panel did do some work and actually produced a report. Here are some of the things and we're calling on Vermonters to because there is this call for folks to get educated and to raise awareness. And this is another tool, I think, uh, towards that goal. Uh, and I think that doing a press conference, um, not me, but perhaps us getting the word out, providing the logistics, convening it, but having uh, you folks speak and to say, this is the report, this is the work, this is what we're seeing in our community. That was my thought as a way to raising raising the awareness of the report and the recommendations. And I uh, would just open that up for conversation or um, thoughts or, or reactions. I'm game. I still have my prom gown. Can't wait. <laughs> Others? <clears throat> I I might just chime in quickly, uh, just that just to add to that. I think a press conference is a good idea. I think it's a lot more effective if we have the chairs of the relevant committees standing up on stage with us. So do a little, uh, you know, preliminary work with Senator Sears, with um, you know uh, Sarah Copeland Hanses, uh, Maxine Grad, um, Jeanette White, to really kind of uh, and, and think, you know, I hate to like, I hate to undercut our report at all, 
and I remember in an earlier, before we released the report, we were talking about putting an executive summary at the beginning. Um, and I, you know, the report speaks for itself, but sometimes, you know, bullet points uh, help legislature, legislators focus. So really maybe think about um, re-releasing it with an executive summary just to help really kind of, you know, clue people into to where we're where we're focused on and um you know those would be my two my two suggestions to do some preliminary work with the chairs and then uh, have them attend the press conference so that they're publicly on the hook a little bit and then um and then to include an executive summary pepper pepper my dear friend yes <laughs> Pepper, could, could I perhaps kindly and with tremendous humility prevail upon you to perhaps draft said executive summary? I would be happy to take a first stab at it and submit it to this panel. One of the criticisms that I heard loud and clear when we talked about an executive summary is that it cuts out a lot of the substance of what we're talking about. <laughs> Um, so I don't want to do that, uh, but I do think that directing people towards specific action items is going to be helpful in this. So I'd be happy to. Short answer. Great. Does anybody want to make a motion? Just so we're all on the same page. A motion about the press conference or about the executive summary? About the executive summary first. Uh, I'll, I'll make a motion that we prepare an executive summary for the reissue of the report. Anybody seconding that? Second the motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? All abstentions? Great. Motion is carried. So, Pepper? I look forward to seeing whatever you come up with. So with respect to timing, uh, it's my understanding the legislature is coming back on the 25th of August. Mm -hmm. So we probably, I mean, want something maybe sooner than next our next meeting. So oh, gosh, we, yes. OK, OK, and just, what, just to be you, clear. If you get it to me, I will disseminate it. OK. OK. And we Great. can do this, I would think, we'll just do it by email. There's no point in, I don't think we need to meet specifically for that. Okay. Okay. Got it. Sec uh, second thing, the press conference. I would like to get us all on the same page around that, if I can. Just get a sense of where people stand with that. So, if we could do the same that we just did for the executive summary that would be helpful in other words we need a motion and a second regarding a press conference uh, i'll make a motion that the panel hold a press conference to re-release the report i'll second Please. that okay all in favor aye aye, aye. aye. opposed all abstentions. Great, motion is carried. So two things we've got done. Pepper's going to work on an executive summary, which we're gonna get around, and we're gonna do a press conference, which is the issue, the report with the executive summary. Great. Can I, I feel pretty- Aton, can I ask a question? You can do whatever you like, yes. <laughs> Um, hey, TJ, how are press conferences going these days? I mean, I've seen a little <laughs> bit of it, but, uh, you know, but mostly it's just, you know, a single person out in a field somewhere, yep. you know, like, what, what are you thinking? I'm thinking, um, obviously, outside, uh, obviously, sufficiently socially distanced with masks, uh, perhaps on the, the state house steps um, or any other location that I, I guess is centrally located that people um, <clears throat> would support. I mean, you know, we could go down to. Brattleboro, we could go to, I'll go anywhere, um, but outside, masks and people socially distanced. Right. Yeah. 
And are the press generally in public, or are we like uh, live streaming it, or is that? No, I think the I think the press will will, will come. I mean, it, you know, I, we got to give advance notice and make some phone calls. But um, I was interviewed yesterday. A reporter actually came to my house and interviewed me on, the, on my sidewalk, and he just said, "We're desperate to get you know people on camera. The, the, they're sick of Zoom too." Yeah. So I think if it's you know in Montpelier, um, and we work the phones a little bit um we can we can get folks there and um you know and i think if we get pepper i think your idea of getting key legislators um there um is, is critical and look this is um this is the most debated and and discussed issue going on not only in vermont but the country i i think we'll i, I think we'll get sufficient coverage uh my question we had you had just mentioned talking, and I don't know why I forgot this, talking to a couple key players such as Senator Sears. Should I be drafting a letter or something? Eitan, with the, with the committee's um, approval, I am happy to call Senator Sears um, to invite him and, and get a weather report whether or not he would be willing okay. to attend. Um, and to make those calls and perhaps have you follow up with with the specific invitation. Um, but I think a phone call would would suffice. Great, great. And I'm I'm happy to do that at the direction of the committee. OK, then are we all in favor of that? All in favor of that. Let's not even go through the motion and all that. All in favor great. of that. Uh, aye, aye, aye. 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 OK, <laughs> thank you. We'll just go there that thank you very much. And when you're done, then I will uh, follow up. What was that? Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, when we're and then when you're done, I'll follow up, as you suggest, with a specific invite. OK, and I guess the only thing that I would need is what would the committee's preference be in terms of um, a, a date and time and location? Do we want to time it closer to the renewed legislative session towards August? Do we want to do it uh, sooner? Um, I, I could go e either way, but throw it out to, to folks. Well, what's going to be our is our main point of the of the press conference to um, let the public know about it, or to re-engage the legislature, or and to ask them to do something additional? Um, because depending on sort of the intent of why we're having the press conference, it may make a difference. in a little bit more detail. Yeah, I mean, I think it, I think it would be both, um, certainly to get the, the public um, engaged in this committee's work, but also I think as, um, <clears throat> I think it was Pepper who so eloquently said, get people to commit, <laughs> that they're gonna follow these recommendations, they're gonna do something about it um, when the legislature reconvenes. I, I, see, I, I see a dual purpose. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Then I would say maybe having it a little bit closer to when they're going to start might make yeah. more sense. Yeah. I think so too. Okay. I think, you know, when you do something like this, though, you kind of want to have kind of uh, the next like steps already lined up. So I feel like the initial contact with some of the chairs and say, hey, listen, here are three action items you can take right away, uh, you know, when you start next session. You know, so the, some of the initial contacts, I think, should happen earlier with the idea that the press conference would be much closer to the August 25th or where, whenever it is that they're going to come in, will come back. I think we're all in agreement, though, on that. Yeah. Yes. I just also want to say that for some reason, on my list, Senator Ballant is apparently here as well. Um, although she's not able, 
I can't see her. So I just wanted you to know that she's here and uh, listening in and hopefully we'll be able to participate. Um, anyway, I'm also, just to get back to that, I'm in agreement. I mean, I think that that's a good idea is to get things going now, maybe even identify some things that they wanted more specificity on and then um, be able to do the press conference and then perhaps discuss that specificity as a panel. It's on, I see Julio's, I think, got his hand up, at least on my screen. Oh, he does? Hi, Julio. Hello. Um, is this a good time? To sure. <clears throat> Uh, this might spark suggestions from uh, folks on the call who are much more seasoned in the trenches with the legislature than I have. I've been doing it for a few years. I think <clears throat> in connection with the executive summary or the summary of recommendations or whatever, we're going to call it um, something that might be a spin-off document um, that could be helpful when going before the committee is just what we always called in the civil rights unit, the one pager that has literally one side of one sheet of paper that summarizes what you're advocating for. Um, the recommendation in bold face and then a sentence or two explaining why you're recommending it. Because we've had over the years, we'll talk with people just for like on the equal pay bill, um, a number of years back, I guess it was uh, two governors ago, um, and we found that we'd have to remind, you know, bill sponsors or people who uh, met with us before the legislative session who were asking, you know, what they could do, but, be, you know, they just needed something in hand. And then when it came time to testify, to have them have your one pager in hand, um, it helped set the agenda as opposed to a 15 or 20 page draft bill that might have a bunch of other folks ideas as well. Um, so I think that would be something that um, we should consider. And sometimes we've done it uh, in a Q and A format also where we anticipated opposition. Um, like we did that on the pregnancy uh, a few a couple of years ago, we were uh, advocating pretty strongly successfully for a bill to require accommodations for healthy pregnancies in the workplace. And we anticipated what the questions would be and put it in that one pager that we could have, not just posted on the website, but literally in the committee room or have a committee members have it here at their desks as they're zooming in to do that. Okay. Others? Any other commentary? Yes, can, Jeff. Uh, just a quick one, or actually two quick ones. One, I'm not even sure who are the, the uh, members of this panel now um, in this shift. Could at some point we just get a, just a, you know, a, a uh, just a list because I know it's in, it's morphing out now and I'm confused, but more, more important, I think it's really important to have this, as many people on this panel represented in whatever event you're doing, because it's really impressive, the diversity of the panel. And I think that's gonna carry considerably more weight. Not, nothing against you or any one or two people, but the idea of all of us as, as you know, as a crazy crew as it is, um, and they're not knife fighting most of the time. Um, I think that would be impressive. And I think that would gather the viewing that we'd like. I agree. I agree. I agree. Is that our standard though? Not knife knife fighting? That's that's the Well, are you good at it? <laughs> no, I don't know a thing about it. <laughs> uh, no, I think that's good. Um, and I would agree with that, that that would be the more of us the better. So Great. Anything else? Okay. Um, I would like to 
move us along to talk about S219, that wonderful bill that just keeps changing and changing and changing. Um, it is actually known as an act relating to requiring law enforcement to comply with race data reporting requirements in order to receive state grant funding. But it's changed into all sorts of other things as well. And I asked Julio if he would, in fact, discuss this this evening. So, Julio? Yes, um, let me just pull things up. So you're looking for the, I just step away for a second. You're looking for the summary of 219? Well, we have the summary. I sent that out to everyone. Okay. But I had asked if you would actually discuss uh, pretty much the current state of the legislation, how people, remember we had oh, okay. sure. in a text about um, your perceptions of how close that bill came to what its intent was, where it would go and so on. I realized this conversation is a bit closed off at this point because yesterday afternoon the governor signed it. Um, but it would yeah. still be good to know because the letter that he sent in, that announced the signing also interestingly made a lot of, rec not recommendations even, but uh, requests, I would say, of the legislature concerning what they look at next in regard to that bill. Yeah, I don't, I don't have his signing statement, but I can, but I, I I've read, uh, you know, a, a summary of it, so I, I can't, I help you there with what, with, what he literally said, but I, yeah, I, I could spend a couple minutes on this. So, two nineteen, I mean, they're really, gosh, I think, over, over the course of the session, of course, it was an interrupted session, and um, with, with the pandemic and everything, but really, there were at least four bills that I was aware of, uh, maybe five, a couple in the House, all, all of the ones that moved, um, uh, progressed uh, in the last four or five weeks of, of the legislature, really Senate bills. There was 219, which was signed. Um, there was a Senate bill 119, which really addresses the definition. We talked about it at our last meeting, that was a definition of, uh, or stating standards for the use of force and deadly force, um, to put that in statute. Um, there had been another bill on the House side, H-464, which rather than stating the standard and statute called upon the Criminal Justice Training Council to develop policies, uh, a model or, or a standard policy um, for use of force. Um, so 119 was really about uh, the deadly force standard. Remember that was the discussion last time about a variety of aspects of that bill, like what's necessary force, uh, a reasonable person versus a reasonable officer uh, standard and the like. Um, I, that, that bill had, um, uh, had gotten through um, the Senate, uh, but had not gotten really very far at all on the House side, uh, the House Government Ops Committee and the um, uh, um, uh, Judiciary Committee um, had been, um, had just been assigned to that literally um, on one of the last days, I don't know, what was the last day of the legislature, the 26th? I think so. Um, and that's literally when it was assigned to GovOps. The GovOps on the House side had taken testimony on it, but they didn't actually have the bill in hand. Uh, so the issue about uh, stating or how you would put out a uniform policy regarding deadly force or force, because there is language there about um, officers' use of force and not just deadly force, um, that hasn't really got, you know, there's been... Uh, no drafts or revisions, it, it hadn't gotten very far. At the same time, uh, public safety, uh, Commissioner Schirling testified throughout the session, um, you know, proposing with, uh, I think, the input and agreement of various law enforcement, um, 
leaders and also community uh, members to put out or to work out a statewide use of force policy uh, and not just limit it to, um, to deadly force. So S-119 is something that House GovOps would take up if it wanted to, they would be the committee would take up uh, when they return, um, if, they, if they're inclined to take it up. Um, the other Senate bill, which at the end was just, I think, called, turned, mar- turned into miscellaneous uh, law enforcement amendments, um, was sort of a grab bag of a, a lot of other issues that did not um, really have much. I mean, I'm looking at the screen and a lot of the people I see on the screen were there uh, testifying. It was a small number of folks that were testifying on 124, but that that addressed issues like, um, let's see if I can pull it up here. Um, that addressed issues like, um, uh, um, it was more aspirational. There was going to be um, uh, materials here about training on de-escalation. Uh, there was going to be materials about, uh, or there, um, let's see, qualifications for law enforcement. Sorry, I have about 20 bills up on my screen right now, so you have to indulge me for a second. Um, it, yeah, it was basically a grab bag. It, you know, some of the larger issues that really did not get much airtime uh, were put on kind of a to-do list for, it, it wasn't quite a study committee bill, although it had some resemblance. Some of the issues that were to be addressed would be on whether the Criminal Justice Training Council would be moved uh, and folded into um, the uh, department or the uh, Department of Public Safety. Um, and uh, there were going to be um, uh, provisions there about um, um, the uh, body warrant camera policy. S219, the one the governor signed yesterday, is basically just a mandate that public safety equip its officers. I think it says all of its officers. And uh, I think one of the comments that I at least read about from the governor was that there are certain officers who don't go out in the field. So if they're, you know, they may not be, uh, I think the point or the suggestion was that you might want to tailor it to people who actually deploy or in, in the field or interact with the public. I'm not sure, but um, uh, 124, one of the issues was to come up with a statewide uh, policy on body worn cameras. Uh, and in testimony, they were basic. The committee was only considering two policies, one that was put together by the Law Enforcement Advisory Board and the other one that was proposed by the ACLU. Um, there wasn't much discussion about other body worn camera, camera policies or legislation. There are about, uh, I think, 26 or 28 states that have legislation dealing with body worn camera policies. There are probably 50 or 60 body worn poli- body worn camera policies out there. Um, uh, but the legislature, you know, was had two in front of it and was taking testimony uh, from the advisory board and from the ACLU and trying to see if there was, you know, how much daylight was in between them, uh, and, and and then try to see whether that could be reconciled. Uh, and and those this, I haven't spoken to ACLU about it, uh, but the, they may be already working on that um, between themselves and not waiting for the um, for the legislature uh, to reconvene. There were there was a call in S one twenty four for recommendations for rega- uh, revised and consistent standards for interviewing and hiring uh, new law enforcement officers, so that. Um, on the one hand, they were getting uh, the right people for the job, and on the other hand, they weren't unnecessarily excluding people uh, who'd be qualified and would do a good job, but because of maybe traditional practices or outmoded um, means of uh, recruiting or, or screening, 
uh, were screening people out. Um, and so that was on the the list of um, of issues uh, to consider. Uh, related to that was um, a recommendation that the RDAP and other um, stakeholders, including the ACLU, I think the HRC, um, see who else is on here, that might be it, um, would look at, it, it just calls for review of current requirements for different aspects of law enforcement, training both basic at the academy and in service on uh, cultural awareness, implicit bias, de-escalation, um, responsible to individuals who might uh, be in crisis or otherwise uh, have uh, either emotional or uh, cognitive challenges in their interactions uh, uh, with the public or with law enforcement. Um, and, and to uh, and to make an assessment basically of you know what the state of affairs is and um, and then make recommendations about how well that's actually carried out in practice. Um, so that that was an area. Um, and um, so I was looking for just a, kind of like what they call a gap analysis, like, what do we think is appropriate and what's actually being provided and then recommendations as to how to close that gap. Um, another uh, area um, that was on the to-do list was for, uh, let's see, stakeholders, let's just include everybody in there, to um, make recommendations about what form or forms of civilian oversight would be appropriate for Vermont's TJ is at 80, I don't know, the number of uh, law enforcement agencies, the number 70, I never. 77, 70, I hear. 77, I hear someone tells me it, the next it, day, 83. Like, What's that? I think it's 77. Yeah. Um, about what the, um, you know, what the appropriate uh, vehicles would be and what, what sort of models would those be? Uh, there was a lot of discussion in this connection in the Senate and the House about civilian review boards, which I think has just become kind of a generic term for some form of civilian oversight. And there was testimony. I gave testimony. Other gave te gave testimony. There, you know, there are different models. They aren't just a board that might review discipline. There are investigatory models and inspectors general and so forth. And so they were looking for recommendations um, that would come out of feedback um, received from the community, but also in conjunction with the AG's office, Human Rights Commission, Criminal Justice Training Council, basically getting it input for everyone, for those who were not present for that um, testimony in the Senate and the House. That was a theme that I think a variety of members of this panel, I think, were very effective in the end in getting through to the legislators, which was that you needed to have more people at the table. You needed to have a broader range of voices um, talking about what communities were, were seeing and experiencing with law enforcement and what they thought was appropriate. There was a real, as there often is uh, in uh, the legislature, a real, uh, it was like, a, for many, I think there was an impulse to just throw something out there, pass it, and then try to to fix it later, which um, is sort of, uh, you know, the history of civilian oversight, any kind of civilian involvement with law enforcement is there's not a very successful history when you don't involve the community uh, in the development of that. And um, so that, that was an area with civilian oversight. Um, uh, related to that, um, uh, in an indirect way was uh, to to examine the issue about access uh, to records related to um, misconduct uh, complaints, as well as uh, records relating to instances where those allegations were substantiated. Um, so not just the complaints, but but the, but the outcomes. And, and and to make recommendations about that. They didn't take a position one way or the other. It was more that different parties would 
provide recommendations. In this, in this case, the Secretary of State's office was included or is named among those who would be part of that discussion. Um, we and Eitan, I'm looking at you. I mean, uh, whenever they were naming people who would be the ones to make recommendations, we would always have to keep adding the line or other interested community members because um, uh, you just want to have it the broadest voice that's um, that's available. And I think that was in the end on the Senate side that was successful um, in the bill as it was passed by the Senate. Um, there was also language about um, uh, recommendations that would come from the Law Enforcement Advisory Board, um, quote, after an opportunity for community involvement and feedback to recommend a statewide policy on the use of military equipment by law enforcement. Um, and I think that is broader than you know, what you see on TV in terms of the armored vehicles and the battle rattle. Um, but there are also things that um, become available to law enforcement, according to some of the testimony, like uh, surveillance equipment. So there are, and and there are, um, uh, you know, there are like bomb detection uh, tech te technologies, night vision, listening devices, all that kind of stuff. It's a big basket, in other words, of uh, of materials that would fall within the category of military equipment and the legislature or the Senate in the bill said that they wanted, you know, recommendations on it all as, as um, you know, as a as a subject. So that's those were the major points. I may have missed some. Uh, the bill as it was passed by the Senate was 43 pages uh, and I'm just trying to hit, I think, um, uh, the critical the critical areas I think I have hit those so thank, thank. Um, um, I also I wanted, also to, wanted to, I'm hearing, hearing myself, myself. Anyway, anyway um, um, I also wanted to point out that s338 which we were initially, before the pandemic, that was the bill that was definitely going to pass this session. And then the pandemic hit, and then that wasn't going to pass this session. And then yesterday it did pass, and it got signed. So I didn't put that on the agenda. I didn't think there was any point in talking about it because it wasn't going anywhere. But now it's actually not just gone somewhere, it's there. And you'll recall that that requires us to work with the Sentencing Commission. When I find out more about how all this is going to happen, I will let you know. <laughs> I, I'm, I feel a little at sixes and sevens that I'm really sorry if I'm not at my usual organized self, but things are happening really quickly and it's a little hard to keep track of all of this. So I will continue to do my best and as I will look into that, and that will certainly um, be on upcoming agenda, just so you know. Um, any questions for Julio? Okay. We're being very efficient, moving right along. Um, and I want, as I introduce Rebecca Turner, I need to let you all know she saved our bacon collectively several times during this legislative session. There were moments where I literally got asked to testify about an hour before the meeting began. And I said to Rebecca, what am I doing? And there were a couple moments, given the wonder of a computer, that she was able to text things to me Nobody would be able to see that I was reading her texts verbatim as part of the testimony from the RDAP. They were like word perfect and absolutely on point. And I just want to publicly say thank you because it was really, I don't think I've ever done anything that close to the bone and you really made it very elegant. So thank you. 
I love technology. Mm -hmm. Same. Same as you, Rebecca. You may have to reserve uh, uh, using your telephone. Now you're muted. Says Judge Gerson. Judge, you're you're muted as well. I'm sorry. There we go. That's okay. <laughs> and 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 Rebecca's gone, but she'll come back. I feel pretty certain. Um I I I don't want to skip ahead because she she actually there was a a method to all of this. So I'm hopeful that she can Hello. Figure. Hi. Hello, I've called in and what I'm going to try to do is get my video going but turn off my mic and see if that works. Okay. So at least you can all right, never mind. I just hung up. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I am sorry. I guess this will have to do. Um, let me know if you have any trouble. I thought I got the kids off the computers. Um, so yeah, no, thank you, Eitan. It, it's been a, it's been a whiplash, and and Julio, nice job summarizing the crazy. Um, crazy maze of the legislature these past few weeks. Uh, I think that jumping right to what Eitan had me on the agenda to talk about, although I, I now don't have it, is that next next moves, right Eitan? Sort of next, right. Next moves, next. So Possible I think, proposals. I think by way of transitioning to that subject, Julio talked about, um, and certainly in the S219 that passed in the intent or purpose section, the bill itself says that they intend to go further, that this was but one stop, one step, right? And that they wanted to put that in writing. I heard them talk about drafting that language into the bill to make sure it was clear to the public that this wasn't enough for them, right? That there was clearly with national events, this urgency because of the prioritization of police violence and um, to lesser extent with these bills, the public health crisis that COVID has presented in, in incarceration. But they certainly committed that intent as well as what I think is significant for purposes of this conversation, language in that purpose section that they wanted to engage as many community members on this topic and while they heard a ton of proposals, there was a deliberate decision to shelve many of the ideas that went to more reform measures, to more real changes, because it warranted and required more input from the community members, more thoughtful exploration that just couldn't be achieved, right? Um, I see the governor's letter that Eitan shared with us kind of repeating that same theme you know, interested in reaching out to the community members, uh, to as many folks around the state to gather ideas and feedback, right? What is the problem and what should we do about it? Uh, and also, I took heart the governor's, what I'm reading, solicitation, invitation from all of us for ideas. 
I also uh, took heart that his letter sort of reflected this moment, right? We're all responding to this feeling of enough is enough, the governor's words in that letter, right? My question to all of you is what does that mean? What does it mean when we say enough is enough? What does it mean when we say enough is enough to police killing black and people who are of color, right? What does it mean that we pass these bills? Is it enough? How deep does this go? Does it just focus, do, should we just focus on police violence and excessive use of force, right? This committee did a great job with gathering all of our disagreements and agreements by compiling our report. And I'm happy that there's going to be a press conference to highlight that. It's very critical. However, I just want to remind this group that that report represented where we were at that moment in time, which was pre, um, well, pre the killing of George Floyd and others that brought this sort of mass movement forward, this mass awareness of this immediate need to end police violence to address it. Right now, luckily for us, that report really reflects a lot of issues around uh, bias, racial bias in policing. It certainly wasn't comprehensive. We knew that when we wrote it. Right. We knew it wasn't comprehensive in addressing unlawful police conduct uh, as that related to our mandate. But we also knew it wasn't comprehensive. It didn't even touch, start to touch on other parts of our criminal and juvenile justice system that uphold the racism that is the problem and what we are mandated to sort of come up with ideas. So while I'm happy that we keep pushing our report forward, I think that what's really critical for our committee and what the legislature and the governor is seeking is what else? What else can we do to effectuate real reform, right? And so to that end, um, we have certainly, you know, gone through the exercise of brainstorming in our respective circles and expertise. I think that now in this moment, it's incredibly exciting to see what is being generated in terms of policy initiatives, ideas, reform suggestions elsewhere around the country. And I see our last bulleted item for today is to talk about how to reach out to sort of connect with other community members and others to get ideas for real reform. I think that in terms of specific ideas that our committee can come up with beyond what we've already settled upon by the report, because I'm certainly not satisfied to just end our work there, right? Yeah. We're not a historical committee. We're current and we're, we were just beginning. And so I just want, want to remind the committee members that we had previously identified parts in the system where we thought there was a high likelihood of racism impacting decisions, where we could start focus and target those points to really see if we could unpackage and limit the effects of racism creeping into those decisions, right? And so this, I, you know, Jess Brown, I think is on this call. Yep. She and I were uh, testifying uh, this summer and giving our specific suggestions. Uh, and, and Jess I certainly jumped in any time. Uh, and I agree with her, but you know, the theme being less contact with the police, the better. Right, but that that is just the problem in terms of minimizing uh, contact, because so many of the times what's happening in a crisis doesn't require the specialized training that police officers bring to the table. Right. So there's problem number one. But instead of using this time to sort of go through all the specific reform ideas, what I thought I'd throw out there and suggest is that as we did before, but now with the the eyes even wider open with, and with the benefit of all the ideas out there and current uh, initiatives that are going forward in other places, um, that we come back to the table, you know, pepper, like seeing what other prosecutors are doing across the country, you know, A, to, to, to get people out of jail, right? And, and again, be the focus, I think there are really two prioritizations that intersect with our mandate and concerns of racism, right? It's not just police violence, but how does the system 
constantly um, impact adversely people of color at every point that they touch, right? Whether it's initial contact with the police, arrest, pre-arraignment pre, uh, custody, post-arraignment custody, uh, you know, the conditions of release and bail imposed, type of charges imposed, what kind of, um, you know, plea offers you get, what kind of sentence you get imposed once you're in jail, how, who's getting the good jobs, who's not, who's getting disciplinary reports, who's getting in segregation, who's getting out early, who's getting revoked on furlough, on and on and on, all the way to the end, right? We identified all these spots. Why can't we now, each of us with our respective areas, go back and see now what is being done now, right? Again, with a focus of real reform. Our focus, I see the proposals being thrown out there, to regurgitate the same old, same old training, right? Training is, is constantly a, a suggestion in various forms, as well as data collection. Now, I don't see anything new that those two subjects bring to the current table. So to me, that, that's not getting us anywhere different, right? So if we're, in, we're committed and interested in addressing these problems and, and suggesting real reform proposals to the legislature, to the governor, then let's, let's, let's see what, what ideas are out there and what we can do. Um, and I just wanted to close with some anecdotes because um, I know that many who are listening don't necessarily see what uh, we see defenders representing people of color in the system in Vermont think there is a tendency to dismiss the problems happening elsewhere as not happening here, right? That, that people tend to talk about this theoretically and want to get ahead of it, right? Not actually recognizing that it is here and it is a problem now. And, uh, to uh, you know, a shout out to public defenders in Bennington County who recently litigated racial justice case uh, involving a car stop with four black men uh, and Route 7, very similar facts to uh, Gregory Zulo, which happened a few years earlier. Um, but this, in this instance, they were driving in the middle of the night in November and was stopped by a uh, police officer and uh, during that stop and detention, um, questions were asked, and the questions asked were of such concern and that it reflected racism that the state's attorney, Erica Marsage, upon reading the motion to suppress and dismiss in the interest of justice that was filed by these public defenders, issued, uh, you know, agreed, issued a letter dismissing uh, or a notice of dismissal with the court uh, acknowledging that the officer's questions roadside were inappropriate and that had these people who had been stopped by the officer who had been white, she questioned whether or not the officer would have asked the same thing. And I wanted to just share what those statements were, right? Um, I'm just trying to find it here. So again, these four, four black men in a car stop, not obstructing traffic, uh, and, um, and they had out-of-state plates, New York plates. And so the officer says, you know, yeah, it's not uncommon for guys from Albany to go to Rutland to drop off product and pick up product, right? And based on my experience, the officer says, it happens quite a bit. It's a good time to travel too. Now, there's, there's no basis to suspect drug activity here, right? And clearly, it's just, it is implicit that this officer suspects and is making these statements. And the officer goes on, hey, listen, I'm not going to lie to you guys at all. You guys are not dumb. Rutland, Albany, drug trafficking, all that stuff, right? Later on in, in the stop, oh, the officer is oh, trying to, uh, oh, um, trying to uh, make some observations to see if they're... Uh, and drinking uh, and is making some small talk and it's just like, well, so you said you played sports. The officer is asking uh, the black man, I'm sure basketball was one of them. And uh, the, the, the client said, no, no, he doesn't play basketball, only football. And the officer said, really? Never pick up basketball? On and on and on. Now, luckily in this case, we had the body cam video 
And so in the motion to suppress and dismiss, the defenders were able to take snapshots. And so this several pages of filings sort of broke down and, and compared what the officer claimed happened and what the video showed, right? And you could see, and the, and the court could see independently the credibility check there. Were the pupils small? Well, let's take a look at what the body cam picture showed, right? So, you know, good for, for State's Attorney Eric Markage for getting ahead of it and dismissing the case. What I wonder is why is that the only one? I certainly, as an appellate attorney, I take these cases after they've been convicted and sentenced, and I'm fighting for these same types of arguments before the Vermont Supreme Court. And sometimes I win and sometimes I don't. And I think constantly all along the way, how many decision-making points had passed before it got to me where someone could have either dismissed the case in the case of the prosecutor, right, where the judge could have imposed a different ruling, where the defense attorney could have made a different argument, right, on and on and on. And so, uh, we're, and you know, DCF is at the table. I don't mean to exclude DCF, but again, calls that were, 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 not, were not made properly in DCF either, because you see a lot of these um, clients having been through the DCF system and their experiences as children and how they were disconnected with their biological parents, right? And, um, and how that continues uh, sort of this, this cycle. I'll, I'll share one more anecdote. And this one is involving body cams again. We talk about how there's legislation and interest in exploring deeper appropriate policies to make sure that the data that's collected on these body cams are appropriate. And that's absolutely important. We don't need children and others who are captured by these body cams to all of a sudden be part of the public record, right? Seen by all. And ACLU director uh, Duff is, is absolutely correct. So we need to understand how much data is being collected and under our public disclosure laws, how much is all automatically being put into the public. But I'll tell you this, while we debate, while the legislature is debating, A, whether to require it, whether to require deployment, whether we have to turn the, the cameras on, I, I litigated a case, State C, Treas, and Kitchen, where he was arrested for disorderly conduct walking down Church Street, black man trying to get to his bus. When apparently to the officers there, they felt he was threatening because he walked too closely by and they told him to move aside to walk a different direction. And he engaged in this conversation with the officer saying, I don't understand, my bus is here. I don't need to go that way and back and forth, right? Now I was his appellate attorney. We have ultimately got that conviction reversed but at the Supreme Court level, finding it wasn't sufficient conduct, right? And in there, there was a lot of subjective calls as, as to what was threatening. What was threatening about this particular person's way of walking across the street and church street? Again, this is Vermont. This isn't 20 years ago, Vermont. This is within the past couple of years. In reviewing that public record, the body cam footage of that incident was submitted. And what you can see or a hand, I forget if it was four or five officers standing in that, bur in that church street area, and they're standing in a circle. And one of the things that we noted was interesting uh, in the office was how those officers were standing so that those body cam footage could not see and get a direct um, viewpoint of my client direct encounter with the officer. We got just pieces. We had to see five different cameras, video recordings, to get a sense of what was happening in that direct encounter. And the key moment there was who, who said what, what caused the initial encounter and, and, and rush for the arrest. So it was critical to see. Again, sort of looking at why are these officers positioned in that way and tilted in an abnormal way just so that the gangled body cam footage just doesn't cover what we would expect it to cover when you talk with someone face to face, right? Again, it seems to me that there are already attempts to try to circumvent the intent. So while we talk about crimes, right? Um, and again, Jess Brown and I made this point, new crimes 
my position will always be it will be a completely ineffective way to go about trying to fight racism. You've got the problem of whether or not prosecutor is going to actually charge it and whether or not it will actually end the conviction. It's too far down to be in too remote. And really, the issue should be focused on who are the victims and the victims' families who are being subjected to the police violence or the police racism or the other government official, not necessarily being the officer, the DOC officer, the DCF social worker who is doing something. There has to be immediate relief, whether it's in the form of reparations to those families, whether it's required suppression of that evidence obtained, right, in that criminal case, something where there is an immediate um, correction. Those are the kinds of real reform changes I'm hopeful that we can come up with. One more anecdote. Can I share this? Just make it really quick. because okay, we've really bring in, This is bringing in the judiciary because I focus on the, uh, the, uh, the prosecutors and police. Again, current events, right? Uh, black defendants being represented by defenders going before judges pre-trial and now what are, the question is what are the appropriate conditions of release that these uh, people should be going forward to. And, and we are seeing judges imposing conditions prohibiting um, our black clients from entering an entire county in Vermont, even though the record made clear that that's where their job is. And it's because of the sense that they are threatening. Again, these code words where it came up during our, our discussions with the legislature, reasonableness, threatening, where the subjective valuations are allowed to creep in, where we bring in our implicit or explicit racism to the table. Again, those, those conditions and those orders have been appealed. They've either been reversed or are pending before the Vermont Supreme Court. But it is here, it's a problem, and enough is enough. The question is, what are we going to do about it? I have a whole complex of questions based on this. And I, this isn't particularly organized because I'm just taking in what you're saying and not, you know, I haven't really thought it through, obviously. But I, it does it seem like there needs to be another more specific addendum to the report in December that gets at those high impact, high discretion points that we've discussed that we then, that we work on now and that we talk about perhaps at the press conference and then in fact submit. Or is that still not enough? I like that idea, Aitan. I would just suggest moving up the time frame, not December, but why not September? More, yes. You know. Yes, absolutely. So in other words, we do what we've been doing for that report that we've already submitted and people go off, give this some thought, perhaps look at the report in December flesh out some very specific things that we, I mean, David's term was always that we wrote that report from 30,000 feet so that perhaps at this point we get more to 10 as opposed to 30 and get a little bit more specific about those points, which seem to be at the root of what you're talking about. Am I, am I misunderstanding or taking this in a direction you didn't want to go in. No, that's a, that's a good suggestion. I, I'm curious what others think. Me too. That was a hint. <laughs> yes, I just... <laughs> I, uh, so I, I hope you all heard. I mean, the Department of Corrections had a, um, a press conference yesterday, and most of the press conference um, coverage was related to an incident about an inmate death. But another important thing that the commissioner um, did announce is his 
creating of an office of professional standards um, and also um, appointing Heather Simons, um, who meant to be at this meeting tonight. She will be coming in the future. She was just um, unable to attend. But Heather is going to lead that office. And one of the important roles and functions for her at the Department of Correction, of course, is to really um, take work that we have started and continue to expand it in terms of bias and fair and impartial um, efforts and, and equity. The commissioner is very um, vocal about his commitment to this um, and things are moving very, very quickly. And we have engaged um, some outside consultants to really help us think through what we're doing as a department, I think, to really address a lot of the things that we've talked about over the course of this panel, some of the things Rebecca just addressed now, and, you know, I don't know what other departments are doing, but I'm assuming a lot of other departments are really taking a very hard look at um, their own systems. And it might be interesting to doing. Um, I certainly think that, you know, what, what the Department of Corrections is doing with um, the new position that Heather has and the consultants we're engaging in is directly going to impact the, the work of this panel. Um, but I also don't know exactly what we're going to have by a press conference in August or a revision of a report in September. Um, so those are some just the initial thoughts that I have off the top of my head. Okay. Other people. Pepper, you've just popped up on my screen. What are you thinking? Um, I think, uh, you know, there, I don't agree with everything that Rebecca said just now. But I do, I would like to say that because of the COVID-19 crisis, I think uh, to Monica's point, all state agencies have taken a long, hard look, and particularly the criminal justice reform, uh, players, the players in the criminal justice system have taken a look at um, things like conditions of release and bail and hold without bail and um, resentencing. So I think this is kind of an apt time to kind of think about what lessons we have learned from that, especially if we're about to see a second spike. And I think that while th those questions don't necessarily have a direct racial component, which is what the task of this committee is, um, I think that uh, we can certainly kind of think about, you know, if we reduce incarceration writ large, and we ha also have an, a, a racial problem in our incarcerated population that it will have, have a second order effect of implicating kind of these uh, racial disparities. So I, I think it's, I think it's a, a good time to start um, working on something like this. I'm not committing quite yet to, I think that our report actually does a lot uh, to move the ball, advance the ball forward. And now we're talking about the legislature has not really taken heed of our recommendations there, and now we're talking about adding more on top of it. Um, so in some ways, I don't know what the best strategy is, but uh, I'm happy to work with Rebecca and others on um, kind of lessons learned and, and where we can go, where, what, what our next stage is. I'm wondering if, go ahead. Go ahead, Jessica. Uh, well, I was just, I sort of feel like what we're skirting around is that, and although Pepper did just say that he didn't agree with everything that Rebecca said, is uh, that when we uh, zoom in from the 30,000 foot level to the 10,000 foot level and get into the nitty gritty, there is not, I don't believe that there will be consensus among this committee, right? So, and I do think Rebecca was trying to make this point, um, one of her points, was that we had kind of gotten, I mean, this, the report we submitted um, reflected what we could reach, you know, the points on which we could reach consensus. And there were definitely issues already, like when we were completing our report, 
around sort of like, well, you know, we don't have consensus on this, so we're not going to include it or it's going to be a footnote or an addendum or whatever. And so I do think that we're sort of talking now about, um, I just, this is a weird analogy, but like, you know, a Supreme Court that issues opinions where not everybody signs on to each part of the opinion and some people write their own opinions and some people sign on to other people's opinions, you know, so I think we need to talk about if we're gonna develop more or, or flesh out or or sort of um, be more specific about different issues that have been raised in the original report, um, we as a committee, as a panel, may need to talk about processes and statutorily what we're allowed to um, or what we decide that we will agree, like how we'll agree to approach writing any additional parts or addendums to the report. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Is there anything preventing us from really reconceiving that as the report or what I'm, I'm, this proposed report, I guess, or addendum as a collection of recommendations on that are not put in any particular order or that are not even necessarily agreed upon by everyone. I mean, I know that was really big the first time around and I get it, but I think at this point it may be more productive to put out a smattering of thought, in fact, because the, I mean, agreement also suggests a certain time frame, and that's not going to happen now. Eitan, I, I do want to just um, raise a point. In, I know we didn't talk about S338, but, you know, that section 19 that you testified on around racial disparities in the criminal justice system study and recommendations, which has, you know, its own data collection piece of it. I mean, one of the main questions they asked, a lot of us who testified, was should it be a report that you all submit together or should it be separate reports? Right. Should we allow for having, and the statute, you know, the bill that passed actually says the report shall include any dissenting opinions among the stakeholders. Right. So, you know, there is some Precedent. there's rec rec there's recognition there yeah. that that this panel has different opinions and it may not be completely resolved, but the legislature wants to hear all of them. I personally am liking that idea, but that's just me. I think you know, it's I, I would ahead. say that I think we've you now we've been working for what two years now, Akon yeah. and you know, we've done a fairly effective job of, of coming up with a consensus report, but I, I guess I would agree with Rebecca. You know, we've done all we can from a consensus standpoint, and maybe it's time that we have to start drawing lines and saying, I I agree with this or I don't agree with that. Yeah. Um, you know, you, as, the, as the committee knows, there are times when I cannot take a position one way or another mm -hmm. because of my... My role in the judiciary, and um, but I think it's time that we we confronted some of these issues, and you know we can't all agree. We can't all agree, but I think the legislature uh, needs to know that. And um, right. you know we had a, a section uh, when this emergency started that was uh, essentially was going to attempt a revision of of uh, review of sentences. There, there's a 90 day provision in there now. Um, in one sense, we tried to make it benign in that it required the defense and the state to agree um, beyond a certain time period. I mean, that that's an area that allow would allow um, parties to to, if you will, revisit some sentences for a lot of reasons. Um, I just think there are ways that we could move ahead that we can't all agree upon. Yeah, um, there wasn't total agreement on that provision. I'm just using that as an example of, um, you know, there was a fairly spirited uh, discussion in the legislature about that provision. It, it didn't get included, but it doesn't mean that it's not a reason to discuss it. And, 
and move ahead perhaps that way. So I, I think this 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 panel has evolved uh, to a point where um, you need to move forward, not necessarily all on the same page. It's my thought. Um, Thank you. I'm, I'm going to stay on as long as I can, but I do have to leave before. Right. Thank you, Brian. It, it, yes, Jeff. I, I would simply say that I have no problem whatsoever in presenting a menu and to encompass uh, I don't think as wild disparities as it may seem when we're arguing amongst ourselves, but I do think it is our job to prevent, present a fairly s straightforward menu. Um, I think the time for the philosophical document will not benefit the time that we're in, the times that we're in. And I think we need to push whatever issues we're going to push fairly soon. Sure, sure. No, I, I, yes, I agree. Yes, thank you. I would just, I, I, the only thing I would add here, I think there is some power rhetorically in having presented a report that represented consensus and now looking at doing something that's actually the opposite. I think it shows where the real profound contradictions are. And it actually focuses attention. That would be my hope. And I think that that makes sense. So I'm actually kind of getting into the idea of doing this at this point. Also, it just in the level of time, it takes a lot less time to do this if we're not all having to sit at a table and come to consensus. It really would mean going back to our different agencies, possibly looking over the report as it stands, fleshing things out in there, coming together and putting that together into a document that doesn't necessarily mean this is what we all think. This is what we all think separately. <laughs> May well be it. I mean, Tom, we're not. Rebecca. Yes. Go ahead, Rebecca. It sounds like there is a building consensus. What if, um, you know, I'm just thinking of, of, of the exercise that Judge Grierson, David Schur, Pepper, and I experienced when we were hashing out. Our certain ideas early on, and we met yes. and saw and thought, okay, where is there, where are there overlaps? And 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 I think an idea is to do that again here, and not just with the government uh, members on this committee, but then also have sort of like whether it's a subcommittee or something with the community members, and going into the next agenda item, community members and others on this panel who have ideas on who else should be contacted and heard, right? Solicited and included in this sort of rush brainstorm and also find where we have areas of consensus, DOC, DCF. And I'm willing to work with others, you know, outside of these meetings you know, leading up to the next one to right. generate sort of ideas. So we're not just all working individually on our okay. own. Okay. What would be a good step now at this moment? We need an action. Can we um, make a proposal? I like what Rebecca said. And can we make a proposal to, to do just that? <clears throat> Great. In other words, right now we should figure out subcommittee, Sheila? Yes, that's what we need to do, yes. OK. I mean, I don't know what other people think about it, but I um, felt similar that I would wanna bring this back to our community here and where we have a strong community even across the state of BIPOC and would love for the community to be involved in this conversation and give their voice. And I would like to move it um, sooner than later. And I think dissenting points of views is gonna be natural. I think that there are, I agree that there are some things I think that we should agree upon 
And so though I like this idea, I think that <clears throat> there is also concern on whether we agree, or agree on the fundamental things. And I think that this um, committee has moved in many ways to where how we're working together, the things we're doing and how we're talking is much different than like three years ago or whenever we started. But um, it's still unclear of whether fundamentally we all um, uh, understand and believe in what we're doing and what terms um, we're, we're using to convey that such as white supremacy and things like that. So I think there are some basic things that I think that we all need to really um, try to come to consensus or understand why we're not in consensus with. And then um, those other points from there on, um, I'm comfortable with having um, diverging points of view and submitting it in that way. Okay. I, all right. My brain's a little rusty. We've got to figure out, I would guess at this point, some subcommittees, which is going to be a little difficult because we got a lot of people from a lot of different places here. So I would entertain some suggestions at this point. So what, we would have, let, I'll just throw some stuff out. So we have DCF. And then we would have the subcommittee that was what? Brian and Rebecca and David and Pepper. That start for two. For Julio's benefit, since David's not here, could you specify what the forward oh, I'm sorry. for that, sub yeah, that I subcommittee would be? Rebecca, you 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 do a better job of summing up what you all did because I remember that night I glazed over. Well, back then when we went met face to face, we went to the AG's conference room and oh, I forget how we got there. We had a list, and then we just figured if there was any overlap and where we had agreement and no agreement, and we just shared where we were coming from. Is this like and the conference committee. Conference committee. Okay. Yeah. I guess my my question is I don't know what list we're working off. I mean we, we have the we we're have the report. It. Okay. I know. So but do we need to what's the step before that? I feel like I'm missing a step around like maybe some more concrete things that people are I mean, I, I heard a lot of people say and I you know I I agree we need some more specifics. How are we gonna come up with those specifics or are the subcommittees doing that? That's what I'm not following. I would, that's a good point. I would hope the subcommittees would do that. And to the extent that, that there seems like, you know, DCF, DOC uh, reps here, um, you know, I can see, you know, the community members, that I, it's um, in terms of overlap and sharing and brainstorming and then going back in and out with our subcommittees, we can share as, a, as we feel appropriate our ideas, specific ideas for reform, so that if we're not specifically involved in a subcommittee, um, whether there's whether that group can respond or think about it and whether they like that or not, so that we don't, you know, I don't know. I, I think I that's it. I'm sorry, can, this, is, this is Jeffrey and, uh, from DCF, and a part of this is my own, um, newness to this particular role in any of the previous conversations that have happened. But I'm trying to, to tease out of this conversation. What happens with those subcommittees? Are they pulling, um, are they examining specific like subject matter areas like DCF, DOC, XYZ, and then teasing out meta threads from those that then get combined into these suggestions? Or is it rather that the um, the approach about where the dissent or the lack of consensus or the tension might be is inherent in kind of those, the issues regardless of where, like which lane they're sitting in. I'm not sure if I articulated that really well. I'm just kind of trying to wrap my head around uh, the, the kind of the siloing of those subcommittees 
by di division of the department. Ryan? So, I mean, this is just an idea, but we start with the report as it is presently reads, and, and this subcommittee could start by looking at that and deciding what areas within that report we perhaps want to expand on or uh, revisit with some of the ideas we had before. And as we explore those areas, we then may, if it touches on you know, DOC or DCF, then we bring them into the discussion. So I don't think we want to exclude anyone that has an interest in a particular issue, but I just look at the subcommittee as maybe taking a broader view at first and seeing what issues that they they think are important enough to expand on from the original report and then bring in the folks that have an interest in it. That would be one way of approaching it, I would think. And then as Sheila's <laughs> saying, taking some of that back right. outside the panel and taking it out to constituency. Yeah. Right. Right. And then come back, obviously, the committee continues to work until they present it to the membership as a whole. Right. That's the way I would envision it. I like that. I know that wasn't very thoughtful. I like that. It gives us something to hold on to. It gives us something to work from. It gives us a template some ideas that are already out there, it means we can flesh them out. I think Jessica is really right that once we get to fleshing those out, it's going to get more contentious, and that's fine. I don't think that's a problem. I think that's actually a strength. It just means that what we need to do is everyone needs to look at the report again right. and, and start fleshing some stuff out. I mean, in that, res in that respect, the, the, um, if everyone did that, they might identify areas that they want the subcommittee to explore further or to take to the next level. So why don't we start with that? An individual effort that we all do it. And then we worry about subcommittees at another moment. Right. It right. is only the beginning of June. I mean, right. July. One of those J months. Yeah. So... I think this, I would say that that would be the way to start with this. So, Aton, if that's two good ideas I've had, then I think I better leave. Well, that feels <laughs> great. <laughs> I mean, if you I'm like those ideas, then I, I think I better leave while I'm ahead of the game. But I think, that, but, but I think that's a, a, a way to start. And it makes yeah. everybody go back to where we were, look at what where we ended up and where do we go from here and then the subcommittee right. can build on it. And then we'll worry about the subcommittees a bit later. Right, right. Because it's just too much to bite off right now, all of yeah. this, I think. Yeah, and everybody needs, I think, to have that input as to areas in what really is a completely different world than when we wrote the report. Exactly. Or, or at least new issues that we have to address and maybe right. we take a, another look at what we avoided before. Right. Maybe what was non-consensus, it needs to right. come forward. Exactly right. that. Right. Um, right. So does, I would say, I'm, I'm just throwing this out here and somebody could make a motion on it if they want, that we all go take the report and start fleshing out moments in there that we find personally compelling. We talk to constituencies about it in that process and start with that. Just start there. The next step is another step, but just start there right now. That would be what I would suggest. If there needs to be more discussion, there does. If not, I think we need to make a motion, or someone does. I'll make a motion to that effect. That we take okay. up the report. I'll second it. Then we vote. All in favor of this process, please say aye. 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 All opposed? All abstentions? Okay. We have homework. Yes. We have homework.
Um, and, and that homework will, I hope, involve taking this out to people outside of this panel and getting their input on it as well. Um, I will uh, just, because it might make your lives simpler, I have a little icon right here on my desktop to call up the report because I never knew when I was going to need it in the last seven weeks. So I will send that out to everyone again as an attachment so you have it right there and you're ready to go on it and you don't have to look through two years of emails to find it or something. And I will do that probably not tonight because I'd kind of like to have dinner, but I'll do it tomorrow morning after I have coffee. Wonderful. Sounds good. Okay. Thank Can you, I, Tom. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good, good to see everyone. Um, I'm going to suggest here going <laughs> forward, we, I had put in the mechanisms for community feedback I'm not sure, and please feel free to stop me. I'm having a chair moment. I'm looking at it and going, oh my God, this is another huge thing. And I feel like we just sort of discussed doing this in regard to looking over the report and coming up with report version two. So my sense is perhaps this should be tabled because we're already going to be doing it. I need feedback because this is Aton having a moment. Well, Julio has a question slash comment. Well, why, of course. So the legislature is going to convene at the last week of August. I don't have a sense for how long they're going to be in town. They have left, they've drawn up in the bill that they that the governor signed, as well as the other two bills that passed one chamber, a to-do list of a dozen plus significant law enforcement reforms, uh, none of, uh, very few of which are small topics. Yes. And so when you're talking about community input um, regarding the task force, uh, the, the, the RDAPs, report there are there are items on in the legislation that are not specifically referenced in in RDAP's report and okay. so you know the legislature and I also you know and and from witnesses there were saying these are issues the legislature cannot proceed on unless we hear from the committee and so the question is with respect to the very specific topics like civilian oversight like body worn cameras like uh, de-escalation training that are actually mentioned in the, those bills uh, and the to-do lists, whether members of the RDAP committee feel like they have a role in working with other groups to organize community discussion either through online town halls or bulletin boards or other means of collecting feedback on those things that are in the legislation since those are closest to enactment, I think. And so um, so I just didn't know what, and, and I'm brand new to this. this, is only my second meetings. And I think the first one, David was there as my training wheel. So this might be my first solo ride. So I just wanted to know what members thought about that because mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how much time they're gonna actually devote to this in August and September, because I think the budget is going to be a very big, a very very big issue for the legislature. Um, so it, I don't know if people were thinking about coordinating and working in the next month to get that ball rolling. It takes a while, Aton, as you know, uh, and yeah. others on the call know. It takes a while just to set those up. So I'm interested in hearing others' thoughts about that. Anybody? I mean, my sense, I guess, would be 
they're coming back in at the end of August. We have time to look at this. We have certainly another meeting between now and then. And this should be at the front of next month. And then is this our plan also to try and um, incorporate this into the press conference idea or were we thinking of doing something that was going to impact future legislation? Because as Julio said, I, I don't know how long they're going to stay in Montpelier once they yeah. do uh, reconvene. <laughs> and so obviously we can do as much as we can do during that time period. But right. Um, this is Rebecca. You know, Julio, I hear you. I, I, I'm, I'm of the opinion whether they're here for two weeks, there's no way we can come up with the substantive answers that they were hoping we'd give them last month because the same issues apply, right? I agree that we should be trying to reach out. I just, I just had thought, you know, Sheila had suggested something fantastic, which is, you know, yeah. using contact and reaching out and doing something less formal. I'm open to a more formal arrangement of reach out. Um, I think formal, informal is good. I don't know if we need to decide that at this meeting as others have suggested is my point. I have to say that when I, you know, when this came up, when I was testifying, I brought up the fora that you, TJ, sort of instituted around the state. And I kept saying this was long. <laughs> We all got educated as to how long it needed to be, that you would think you could do it within three weeks and you really couldn't. And everybody's eyes rolled. It was like, they liked the idea, but they wanted it to happen in, you know, 48 hours. And I was kind of like, um, we got a problem here, folks, because that's unrealistic. So if you want community input, you're going to have to slow down because people just aren't going to work that fast. It's not possible. But they like the idea of the fora around the state. I mean, it was it was ironic. I mean, I, I, I just got to a moment where I didn't even know what to say. I was going, all right, well, you can't have it the way you want it. I'm sorry. And that didn't go very far. <laughs> But I mean, that's one issue I've got here. I mean, I, I and Julio, I think you've got a great point. But I, just, you know, not, remote town hall meetings, online comments, none of this happens in a short period of time. Yeah, and it's just to clarify, fun. just to clarify, I wasn't saying that this get done by August. I was okay. saying, are there plans to get this rolling and work with other groups because? There are a lot of things in this legislation that are not in the RDAP report, uh, yes. and and if we and I think it's good that RDAP continue and expand on its report and maybe refer to some of that, but that's going to take time, and there may be a parallel. I don't know if it's a parallel track or if it's a single track for a, a lot of things that are already on the runway. The legislature says we've identified a dozen things we commit to working on, um, many of which, like I said, are not, uh, there are many topics, Rebecca, Rebecca brought up great topics and the, the report has great topics, but they're also a lot broader um, than the dozen very specific topics that are already before the legislature. And I know everyone has limited bandwidth. So I'm just wondering if people are thinking about, we don't have to decide today, but I'm interested in people's thoughts about what role does this committee play uh, or panel play with others to have those fora to talk about body worn cameras, to talk about de escalation policies or pretext stops or whatever the issues that have been laid out? Because my fear is that if that doesn't get very far, then it's going to be the same 10 people sitting in a room or a virtual room going through red lines with red ledge count council that's my worry um 
my thoughts are that, of course, we have to bring this back to our communities. Um, again, not about us, without us, and it needs to be the most impacted communities that are given the opportunity to have voice in this conversation in multiple ways. I think that going informal is great, and I think that we should be doing that, both as individuals where we are positioned and who we have access to, but I also think we should do it in a more formal way, such as around the state and having town halls and making it at different times and various times and having a few different meetings so that people can be able to access that both um, maybe in person with their people in their community, as well as something where maybe they're not in community like that, or because of COVID, it is um, it creates the barriers for them not to be in those situations. So we need to have the voices of the community because every time we create what we're creating and we give what we give and then we get the pushback from the community because we didn't involve them in the vo their voice in the in in the process so then we keep on going back when really we should have just um at the beginning um had a um held space for people to um, give their voice and opinion so i would be interested in um supporting us reaching out to the community and informally as well and structuring something so that we understand that we're brainstorming around the state of what connections do we have and who are the most impacted populations and people that we should be directly reaching out to to make sure that their communities are getting this information. Here, here. How about, I, I'm going to recommend, given that time is short, Obviously, we can't go through this completely. I really like what Sheila just said. I, I just think that's it. Um, but I think we need to talk more about what Sheila refers to in terms of going around the state and having those more formal meetings. And I also think, Sheila, if, you, if you're available at some point, I think you've got to like talk to the legislature about this too, because I think they need to hear it. They've heard it, I, they, I'm boring. Um, they need to hear it from other people right now. And I, I would really love it if you could say this. So for what that's worth. I'm down. I tried channeling you, I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I did, girl. I tried really hard, <laughs> but um, but I really think that we need to do that because I really there may be a part that has to be said. You guys, it's just not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen overnight. If you want folks to talk, it's going to take time. Stop thinking in like you know business models. It's just not going to work. So that may need to be something that gets said with a rubber mallet. All right. Well, this was fun. Thanks, everyone. We all, um, I'm going to send out the report in the morning so everyone has it, can make more specific comments based on it, not worrying about agreements, um, to take it back to communities get comments, we will come back and do this some more and refine it from that point. The next meeting is the 11th of August, same time, 6 to 8 p.m. All other bits of information will be conveyed in emails, which I know you all love. All right, anything else anyone needs to bring up? No. Okay. A motion, like, you know, to have dinner. So moved. Great. Seconded? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All Aye. Aye. Grand. Everybody go off and have dinner. I will see you all in August. Good or night. before. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. everyone.